Pon, 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 pon. It's a busy day in Florida as the Coast Guard responds to distress calls everywhere they turn. Hey, this guy's waving us down right here. Off the Gulf Coast, choppy waters threaten to sink multiple boaters. We're going down, going down, Amazing. While in Miami, an urgent plea for help sends the boat crew on a harrowing mission. He's accelerating outside the buoy right now. He's gonna crash with someone. Hurry up now! And in Clearwater, the air crew races an oncoming storm to medevac an injured sailor. We're dodging thunderstorms. The Florida Peninsula, a hotbed for Mother Nature's fury. Here every day. The brave men and women of the Coast Guard's busiest boat and air stations vigilantly patrol nearly two million square miles of turbulent waters, protecting the public from the dangerous elements and preventing foreign threats and illegal drugs from reaching our shores. America's southern waters are protected by Coast Guard Florida. Pon, 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 pon. The United States Coast Guard in, in Miami, Florida has received a distress alert from a personal locating beacon with no vessel description, approximately 13 nautical miles west of Clearwater, Florida. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Tom Huntley. I'm a H-60 pilot here at Air Station Clearwater. Uh, we're out on a training flight. We just got on scene with our training boat and we get a call that there is a personal marker locator going off somewhere north of our position. We think possibly that somebody has gone overboard. We're coming on scene right now, and it's a whole bunch of barges, uh, some sort of, there's a tugboat out here and all kinds of stuff, so what hell these guys? That sun is something. Yeah, it looks like the winds are still out of the east, generally. The weather is quite favorable. We have great visibility. We have an east wind uh, today, so that's causing a little extra chop. Vessel Charleston, Vessel Charleston, Coast Guard helicopter, rescue 6008. Can you come back on your 16, please? We just had a report of a 406 EPIRB going off in this vicinity. An EPIRB is an uh, emergency position indicating radio beacon. It's basically a, a distress beacon, and uh, the Mariner can set it off, and it continually uh, alerts of their emergency. Uh, Trace Charleston, they know EPIRB coming up on us. Do you have anybody in the vicinity by the name of Timothy Palmer? DJ, yes. All right, his 406 e perp is going off. We're checking the guy's locker just to make sure his ain't going off, but uh, he is home in the bed right now. But we're checking. If he's accounted for and all your uh, personnel are accounted for, we'll report back to our headquarters that you guys are okay. Yes, sir, everybody's accounted for. Roger that. As it turns out, the uh, captain of the dredge vessel realizes that the person who the PLB is registered to is safe on shore, and uh, his marker just happens to be inadvertently going off. Roger, uh, we're going to depart the scene now. Thanks. Hey, this guy is waving us down right here. All right, coming around. This guy is waving a flag. Vessel underneath the Coast Guard helicopter. Hop back on Channel 16. We were literally flying away, and then all of a sudden we see these guys waving us down like they're drunk, and we started looking a little bit closer, trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah, I, okay, I, got, I got the little pantomime there. I think they're flying water out with their ice cream, sir. All right, let's see if we can get them on 16 again. I am. Uh, and a vessel painted water out. This Coast Guard 6008. How do you hear us? Nothing. So we decided to drop down a radio to him with the trail line. We set it to channel 16 radio and put it put inside of the Pelican box that we had. And I tied that to a trail line. Target inside trail line is going down. Watch these guys. They don't have life jackets on or at least one guy holding on on the uh, port side. So let's watch him. Yeah. They look like they might be uh, listening pretty low in the water, but it doesn't look like they're in any immediate danger. All right, radio is away. Radio is in the water. They're pulling in the radio. Roger. Radio is on deck. Sweet. I got you. Hey, fellas, what's going on? Think 
about putting this water pump down there or no? If you want to, we can. It's, they, have, they have a lot of shit the boat. It might be tough for them to set it up. We did talk about lowering our dewatering pump, but because the boat was so small, uh, we decided that, that that was a little more risky than, than needed. Suck Mary Bennett, coming up on your side. If you could just uh, try to pull alongside these guys and uh, see if you can help out, we're going to be overhead. OK, all right, we'll do that. One of the tugboats from where the PLB was going off asked if, they, if we wanted them to help, so they came over. We're maintaining right now. I don't know if I have a hole in the hole, though. Roger that. Yeah, if you look at your 6 o'clock, there's a uh, Good Samaritan vessel coming out to you guys. We'll remain on scene. How much longer do you think you have before the vessel is uh, totally overtaken by the water? As long as we maintain on the back like we're doing with the bucket, I think we'll make it. But if we take another heavy hit, we're, we may be in bad shape. All my electronics are gone, and I'm, I'm at full throttle. That's all I got. Yeah, Roger that. We'll remain on scene until you guys are safe. Very good. Just be advised, the Coast Guard uh, small boats also in route to help out. Over. We just lost our build. Okay, they lost their build. They're gonna start taking the water quick. Off. They're gonna need to come off that boat. Yeah. Now, vessel taking on water. Do you want to try to make it to shore, or do you want to get off your boat? No, we'll stay. We'll stay on the vessel. Yay, Coast Guard's here. Sector St. Pete launched a boat out of Station Sand Key to render assistance. It looks like they're riding a little bit higher now. Yeah. The boat from Station St. Key, they're able to render uh, more immediate assistance without us taking on the added risk of uh, hoisting our swimmer down to, to assist. Yeah, it's like Mary Bennett. Uh, do y'all want us to stay, or? You guys can go ahead and break station as the 45-footer is on scene. We appreciate it very much, sir. And uh, tell uh, Tim Palmer to make sure his keeper stays off unless he's in the water. All right, we'll do, we'll do. Roger that, you guys have a great day and thanks for the help. Sector St. Pete, the 45670 is on scene. Do you need us to maintain? Roger, thank you for your assistance. You are uh, free to uh, break off. Roger, uh, we're going to depart the scene now. Man, what's the dumb luck? He said he's lost comms, he's taken on water, we have it to fly by. Good thing we got the A team on board. Exactly. Not bad for a day's work. Lives assisted. Lives assisted. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. We're going down, going down, Mayday. Yeah, get ready. We left that boat, and we heard a Mayday call saying that another boat are in distress, and they were going in. You always got to be uh, ready when you're the ready crew for a SAR case to happen and be diverted. Going down. Give me your location. Tarpon Spring Rex. Tarpon Spring Rex. Roger, Tarpon Spring Rex. How many persons are on board near vessel? Over. We're in the water. Spring they say uh, Harpin Springs wreck. We're going down and we're in the water, and that's the last we heard of them. And sector rescue 6008 dead routes to Harpin Springs. Unknown number of people in the water. They're not coming back on 16. That's all we got. We'll be on scene in five minutes. Nice. Uh, we immediately uh, started heading north towards Harpin Springs. Not exactly sure where the uh, the wreck is. There are a number of uh, diving wrecks out there. Pond, 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 pond. The Coast Guard is due to report a vessel taking on water in approximate position. 28-08. Using uh, Rescue 21, which is the Coast Guard's radio system that was just implemented, the sector was able to triangulate their position and, and give us a, a latitude and longitude where we flew. I got something at 12 o'clock. All right, guys, we got something at 1 o'clock. Looks a little jacked up from here. And Sector Rescue 6008 then routes to Harpin Springs. Unknown number of people in the water. That's all we got. We'll be on scene in five minutes. Nice. Uh, we immediately uh, started heading north towards Tarpon Springs. Up from here. 
Okay, I see, see people up at the bow. Yep, I come down to uh, about 30 feet over this plant on a free fall. Luckily, I was already dressed out from the last case. All right, winds are uh, out of the east still. OK. Swimmer is ready. All right, I'd right, stabilize at 12, and you can deploy the swimmer. Roger, deploying first. Swimmer is in the water. Swimmer is OK. Clear me back in left. Uh, a free fall, typically, we do that only during the day and if the, uh, the water conditions and water depth are known. Uh, at this point, we were well offshore, and it is the most rapid method of getting the swimmer to the survivors. When I got out to them, I asked them if they had any injuries, which they replied that they had none. And then, is there anybody out here, or is it only you three? And it was only them three here. All right, there's the uh, signal. Fast going out the cabin door. This is going down. Forward and right, 15. One of them has lost her life jacket. Yeah, I see that. Our rotor wash was blowing the boat and blowing them around a little bit. Hold on, I gotta, I gotta board for a second. I'm just gonna... Okay. Do you want to stay away and have the swimmer swim? Yeah, exactly. yeah, okay. We back the helicopter off and make sure that the rotor wash isn't in, infringing on the uh, rescue area. So the swimmer had to swim them back towards the helicopter. Ask is coming up. While he's putting them in the basket, you could tell they were a little shooken up and stuff, and they didn't want to really trust the basket too much. They were holding on to it when they shouldn't have been. Basket to the cabin. All right. Basket's going down. Basket's in the water. Taking a load. Basket's coming up. Basket is the count. Jenks, confirm that there's only three people on board okay. and ask them if anybody needs any medical assistance. Okay, nearby. Yeah, uh, there's only three people on board and they said you do not need any medical assistance. Alright, thank you. Basket's outside the cabin door. Basket's going down. There's their legs. The captain was fairly upset because it was his boat and it was his responsibility for capsizing it. Forward. And hold. As the rescue swimmer was putting the survivor in the basket, he was holding on to the top of the basket. I got the ready for pickup signal, and as I started picking him up, I got the hold signal from the swimmer. And the swimmer's trying to get his hands off the sides of the basket, and the survivor didn't really want to sit in the basket. He was kind of scared from going under the water, I think. Here, take a load. Take a load. Please. Roger. Basket's going down. The last breath of the kilo is kind of a boat shore wreck right now. Okay. My name is uh, Joe DeBellis. I'm the captain of the boat. And uh, I've had boats since I was a little kid. Clear, clear the water, clear move back and left. Roger. We came down with a bunch of friends to do a little fishing and relaxing from the you know, everyday life. And swimmers in the cabin, hoist the police. I really don't know what went wrong with the boat, but I believe that the bilge pump uh, failed to work. Uh, the back wall of the boat was getting water, and, uh, you know, that's when it all happened. The boat flipped on the side, and I just slide it out into the water. In those situations, you really can't think straight. You know, we panicked a little bit. I remember I had a, a ship-to-shore radio, and I told my friend Nick to Grab the radio mic and call channel 16. Mayday, mayday. We are in route. We picked up three survivors. They're all fine. They do not need medical assistance. And we'll be on deck in 10 minutes. It's over. It felt horrible of what happened. I wanted to get out of the water so bad. You know, you don't know what is going to happen. And uh, I kept thinking about sharks. If we couldn't get to the radio, I guess we had to wait for. Uh, God to help us. When I saw the helicopter come over, well, I felt great. And I looked at my friends. Materially doesn't mean anything, but I'm very happy that me and my friends are all uh, alive. When I was uh, much younger, 
I tried to join the U.S. Coast Guard, but I was not a United States uh, citizen. But I would have loved to do that. Oh, man. Thank you very much. Thanks for sightseeing ride, everything. Yeah, not a problem. Glad you guys are safe. All three survivors were happy to be safe on deck. Uh, I joined the Coast Guard to save lives and make a difference. I think we were able to do that today. I love doing my job. I love being a rescue swimmer. But as exciting as it is, for them, it's their worst day. I thought you would be smiling. It's not like a, uh... Smiling is good. Up here. We're all alive, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. When we were able to complete three cases in uh, a little over two hours, it was, uh, it was a pretty neat day. This will be a good story over some beers later, Joe. Remember that. I don't know how to thank the Coast Guard. Just did a great, wonderful job. So I thank you very much. And um, life goes on. And we're already looking for another boat. Someone on 16 was saying that they saw a boat driving erratically. They believed he was trying to play chicken with the other boats. Going too fast, you're gonna kill somebody. Stop, get away. This boat's rocking pretty good. I don't know if you guys see that, but yeah, uh, we got you coming up. Could hurt a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. You're always thinking about things that could go wrong, but you can't get caught up in them. I'm Lieutenant Tom Huntley, 60 pilot at Air Station Clearwater. It's one of the few weekends I've got off and I'm uh, gonna enjoy the beautiful weather. I keep reeling it in a little bit. Today I'm looking forward to just spending time with the family. We have two kids, uh, Willem is eight and Addison is five. Yes. Nice. Willem really wants to catch a fish or a shark, so hopefully we'll get the, the former, not the latter. I just saw a fish jump right over here by your lure, Willem. Yeah. My name is Tia Huntley and I'm Tom Huntley's wife. As far as the star cases go, we have a rule that he is not allowed to call me before he goes out. You want to reel in and we'll, uh, we'll go kayaking, buddy? Ah, you take it. Okay, I'll take it. When we were first in the Coast Guard, he made the mistake of calling me right before he went out, and the weather was crazy. It was like sideways rain and storming, like, just crazy. It was dangerous, so and for like five hours, I it was a total wreck. Oh, I see it. Hey, we just saw a fish jump, Tia. My wife, Tia, is super supportive of our family. I couldn't do what I do without what she does. Whoa! Okay, I'll do it for you. And you like it. Tom went into the Coast Guard shortly after we got married, so I really don't know anything different. You know, we have the same trials and tribulations as everybody else. Just rescues are a little different than, you know, coming home from a business meeting. He's been actually pretty lucky. We're pretty new here, and he's had some good beginners luck getting some good cases, so. It's really important to spend time with the family when we're not deployed or uh, on duty or flying. The weeks are pretty busy, but uh, we get to, uh, get some precious time off. Today went great. Uh, Willem and Addison had a wonderful time, and T and I really, really like spending time like this, so we had a great day. All right, let's head in. Go down there, little turkey. to Blaine Packard, Station Miami Beach. Call comes in, I think it was close to midnight. Uh, someone on 16 was saying that they saw a, a boat with no nav lights on uh, down by Elliott Key. A lot of people like to anchor out there partying. They thought they saw one person on board driving erratically. They believed he was trying to play chicken with the other boats. Uh, which led us to believe that this person may have been intoxicated. Okay, Roger, man, that's a good copy. He's coming around us, accelerating around us, and like, he's like, being aggressive. We don't know what to do, and we tell him to slow down, and he doesn't slow down, he's gonna cause an accident. 
My name is Fireman Joshua Cox. I am a crewman and boarding team member on the 45-foot boat at Station Miami Beach. The move was a little tense. We didn't know what to expect going down. Call side, call side, do you call me? Is it an emergency? Come on! We didn't know if this guy was really playing chicken. We didn't know if he was maybe intoxicated or under the influence of some type of drug. He's accelerating outside the buoy right now. He's going to crash with someone. Hurry up now! Now we're looking at possibly going into a scene at night without a lot of light. We have people possibly in the water, may or may not have life jackets on. We don't know what the situation is. You get a boat right off the bow almost. comes in, it was close to midnight. Uh, someone on 16 was saying that they saw a boat with no nav lights on uh, down by Elliott Key, driving erratically. They believed he was trying to play chicken with the other boats, uh, which led us to believe that this person may have been intoxicated. Oh, I see it. This boat's going uh, at a good clip. I think the throttle's buried. Look at that thing. By now, it was almost 1 o'clock in the morning. We put the spotlight on it, and uh, I could see the vessel running around in circles. There's no nav lights working, uh, and there's no one on the boat. I'm Randy Beckner. I'm a seaman at Station Miami Beach. At first, it was pretty spooky just to see a boat with no one manning it. It was almost like a ghost ship. It was at full throttle, doing about 25 to 30 knots. It doesn't sound that fast, but when you're on water, that's actually moving pretty good. Hey, you just poking uh, super tight with that thing? Get someone on? No. It's not like, you know, coming alongside another car doing 10 miles an hour and just hopping over. It doesn't work like that. There is no possible way of getting someone safely onto that boat without causing another safety mishap. Hey, do you know where the owner's at? It's on one of these boats, I know. Hey, I'm going to go talk to this guy. We found out that the owner of the boat was actually picked up by a Good Samaritan on a yacht. How much gas does that boat hold? It holds 100 gallons, and it's at least probably about 40 gallons. 40 gallons? It's at least two or three hours. Sorry. Yeah. Two or three hours. There's a lot of things that could happen, and that boat could very easily hit another boat. And he did confirm at that point it was at full throttle, and it was going just as fast as what it looked like. Are they coming alongside? Yeah. We pulled in closer, and we were just trying to decide what to do next. You can try running the tow line across in front of it. Uh, no, that too. I say you get your heaving lines and actually you know, make a couple passes and toss them in. There was a plan put in place from the 33-foot uh, boat that we were going to start to try to foul the props with some of our heaving lines. All right, I'm ready when you are. Hey, am I going to throw port side or starboard side? Yeah, you got the best throw on this side, right? Yeah, that works. All right. Close as possible. As close as possible and keep it safe. We tried to get as close as we could to the boat throw the line and then back off and hope that the boat would run over the line and get entangled into the prop, causing the boat to stop. Now! Back and go, back and go, back and go. Watch that line! I got, I'm neutral. That went right across, he drove right over it. Check on the side, I threw it, and the wake may have pushed it out. Unfortunately, the boat was driving so fast and was turning so hard, it was actually pushing the lines away from the boat, which was causing it not to get entangled. There it is. It just wasn't working. It was hard to get close to the boat. It was just going so fast. And we were just afraid that any more attempts at throwing the heaving line was just too dangerous. Got it. Lines on board. Please be advised, lines have been deployed. It was ineffective. Yeah, let's reevaluate. The other option we had was to try to get close enough 
to use a boat hook to reach over to the throttles and bring the boat to neutral. We thought maybe that would work. We all, at that point, had our helmets on, put our seat belts on. We were braced in case it didn't go the way we planned. Oh, see, it's heading somewhere else right now. Look, look at it. It's making wider turns right now. Our weight actually changed the course of the boat. Right behind us. Ah. Oh, this thing's changing course. It changed course. You need to go alongside that thing now. It's going too fast, you're going to kill somebody. Stop, get away. The boat made a quick turn in the opposite direction and came right at us. We definitely thought for a moment that we were about to have a collision with the boat. I think maybe we're just letting it run out of gas. That's it, man. Holy crap, that was really close. That was a very scary moment. We didn't know what was going to happen. So we decided we weren't going to try anything else. We we're just going to let it run out of fuel. To the vessels in the vicinity of the erratic boat and Elia Key, please weigh your anchors and start heading away from Elia Key. Even though we were waiting for the vessel to run out of gas, that definitely didn't make any of us less alarmed. All of us had our heads practically pressed to the windows, trying to see if it changed course. They're not going to get anything out of it. And nobody knew if these guys had any time. Oh, we started out! Oh, oh, stop! Stop! Roger, run again. Let's get somebody on board before it takes off again. The boat did eventually die out on its own at about 2.30 in the morning. Slow down! Slow down! It's over. Yeah, it was simply full throttle. Oh my god, that was full throttle. Yeah! Woo! That was the greatest moment. We pulled up alongside, jumped over immediately, pulled the kill switch, put the throttles down, secured the vessel. Up here I'm still a break-in crew member. We just finished boot camp a few months ago, and I really wanted to participate in this evolution so I could learn how to tow a boat. So Fireman Cox took the lead and helped me with the evolution since it was my first time doing it. So basically, just come up here. He's going to put you right alongside. You're just going to reach down, flip it, and then we'll go from there. Because it's one thing to just talk about it in the training room, but it's another to be out there doing an actual tow in, in a real case. Clip it on there. There you go. Let out 50 feet high. You got one boat by the boat you're towing. And... I don't believe any one of us have ever dealt with a boat that was driving like that. But everyone was on the ball. Both crews of both boats did an, an outstanding job. Breckner, you're just going to wrap it around there twice and bring it back to the cleat. In the end, it all worked out. The boat stopped. No one was harmed. Everything was good, and we managed to keep the scene secure and make sure nobody was hurt. Thank you, Captain. All right. Hey, we got it. Right, we got it. All right. Sorry for the trouble. Make sure next time you be more careful about the boat. Yeah. This is a case I'll definitely never forget, partly because it was my first big search and rescue case at station, and also because that imagery of that boat just going around in circles, almost looking like a ghost ship, I don't think that'll ever leave my mind. Trying to do an approach to the boat was pretty difficult. I was definitely a little nervous about it. This boat's rocking pretty good. I don't know if you guys see that, but yeah. Yeah, it's definitely rocking. Operations of Tenny J. Julie. A medevac case? Where is he bleeding from? 
And you said it's a container vessel? Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. The patient, he's having uh, ulcer-like symptoms. He's bleeding from his urine, stool, and he's vomiting blood. They already spoke with the flight surgeon. He recommended a medibat. Okay. It's currently 315 nautical miles east of Jacksonville. So they told him to uh, head toward Cape Canaveral. He's making 21 knots right now. Let's pull up the radar real quick. If they go now, they can probably beat this. And talk to us 2-3 and tell them we're going to go ahead and send them. We were on our way out to the vessel and realizing that once the sun sets, it's going to be very, very dark. No illumination, the moon had already set, so we knew that that would just create a very challenging environment to do the hoist. So uh, we're looking at also launching C-130, obviously, for cover off the East Coast case. You know, as we see, the weather is pushing from the uh, west to the east. And so having the C-130 out there will be able to vector them through. Chris Ferguson, operations officer here at Air Station Clearwater. One of the advantages of having a C-130 fly cover for a long-range medevac is they have better radar on board and better weather mapping. What's going on, folks? They are able to plot out a safe course through storm fronts and things that the H-60 would normally have a hard time navigating. So it's always a great comfort to know that those guys are overhead and are not only looking out for you, they're sometimes acting as big brother telling you where to go. We're dodging thunderstorms. By the time we were on scene, it was uh, very dark. Uh, we had overcast skies and no moon, so it was the darkest I've seen in quite a while. Even wearing goggles, we had no visible horizon. It was a pretty stressful flight. It was very challenging conditions. All the lights for the ship is kind of washing up my goggles. Trying to do an approach to the boat was pretty difficult. You want to take the controls and go with the goggles here? Sure. It's disorienting going from flying all the way out there on goggles when it's dark to staring at a boat where that's completely lit up like that. So I said we circle a little bit, try and check on this boat. It's a hard exit. Came around a couple times while we decided how we are going to go hoist. We go to that raised part or the very forward? I'm not totally sure. Be honest with you. Is there an area you guys would prefer to use to place the stern or we'd have a big... I don't know, see anything in the back. Okay. I think the bridge wing is probably the best spot because then you can look at the whole boat. There's all kinds of incendiary other stuff. Well, I don't think that's a good idea. We were hovering next to the boat for a half hour before we could even figure out how we were going to do it. You guys seen it? Is it on top of that tower there? I don't. That doesn't mean that there's not one there, though. So why don't we have them come uh, mid speed and we'll uh, look at doing a bow hoist uh, with us oriented 90 degrees. All right. Let's try that perpendicular to that. Uh, initially, we were just going to kind of fly the same course they were on. But uh, their big stanchion sticking up. So we spun around and basically were perpendicular to their course. It just kind of slid right as they were driving, went straight to the bow. Yeah, it's probably best. I was definitely a little nervous about it. Charles Island from uh, helicopter 6023. We are moving into position. Can you put me in between those four pylons? Is that where you want to go? Yeah, if you can hit that, that's good. Yeah. The only area to hoist from looked like it was the bow. It was about a 10 by 10 foot area. And there was about 
three foot cleats standing off the bow that were uh, gonna produce a couple of problems. This boat's rocking pretty good. I don't know if you guys see that, but yeah, yeah. it's definitely rocking. You really gonna have to be careful timing that up. Catch it coming up, could hurt a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. You're always thinking about things that could go wrong, uh, but you can't get caught up in them. If you're thinking about failure, it's gonna inhibit your success. Let's check complete. Somebody's going down. A 50-year-old male was uh, suffering from internal bleeding and then some other issues. And uh, we were going to pick him up and bring him back to the East Coast to, uh, to a local hospital. Somebody's going down. Somebody's going down. And somebody's holding. And right 30. Right 5. Let me get Easy forward and right. Contact. Numbers okay. We had received some conflicting reports about the patient uh, being ambulatory or non-ambulatory, and so we wanted to get our swimmer, Spencer Carabello, down on the vessel to assess the patient. I don't know if you're calling for the, uh, is that a... Uh, Looks like a litter. Litter. Yeah. Oh, for a litter. And in this case, the patient had to be hoisted up in the litter because he was not able to stand up. And litter's on deck. No references here on the left hand side. Do you see any kind of horizon? Negative. I think it looks like they got him in the litter. Okay. Alright, getting ready for pickup signal. Rest check part two. Boy, six connected, eyes are ready for pickup signal. And Fred, take the load, take the load. I was bringing him up. I was pretty windy. Just trying to control the swing, sir. He was spinning around a lot, so I got him just below the cabin, started to slow his spin. It is coming up. And litter's coming inside cabin. Litter's secure inside cabin. All right. Brought him into the cabin, and then we went straight into hoisting Spencer back up. Numbers just full of cabin door. This rescue is definitely a little trickier in terms of hoisting than any case I've had. Numbers coming inside cabin. Nicely done, Thomas. Water! Roger. The patient was responsive once he got on board. I was just monitoring his vital signs and making sure he was stable the whole way. He's just really, really dehydrated. Yeah. He needs an IV. What's our EPA, sir? I said one hour and 30 minutes. Well, we got a little subverted around weather here, so we can the way. Sir, Roger, go ahead. Everything to the east of Melbourne and stuff that's going around right now is pretty heavy stuff. While we were en route to Melbourne, the C-130 indicated that some heavy weather was going to pass through there. So we made the appropriate arrangements and we diverted our flight down to West Palm Beach International. You guys did really good at this challenging situation. Good job. Thank you. This rescue is definitely a little trickier than any case I've had. My crew performed excellently. He's responsive, definitely. So, you know, credit goes to them. My job was easy because of what they were doing. Always feels good to, to help somebody. I believe that's God's purpose in my life, and it's definitely satisfying to be able to help someone. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Big and high. Carabello, AST3, United States Coast Guard, Air Station Clearwater. Right. Unhook. I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. My dad's been in the Coast Guard for coming up on 20 years now. Right. One path. One path. One path. Right hand release. Right hand release. My name's Commander John Carabello. I'm the commanding officer privileged to be a commanding officer of Port Security Unit 311 in San Pedro, California. My son, second generation Coast Guard aviator, is about to take me through what he's currently living today. So uh, it's going to be a great day. Awesome day. Yeah. Looking, looking forward to it. Do the rest of the interviews with that. Ah, there we go. How's that look? Good? Seeing Spencer in his element, choosing to serve the country as a rescue swimmer is just an incredible, humbling, and, and honorable experience. So I'm pumped. 
absolutely pumped. I know, I know it's going to be a top 10 day. Okay. Say, so I, uh, I haven't been getting up much lately, so um, this will be my first RT2 for the semi-annual. Okay. And uh, probably about my so fifth. It's been, it's, been a few, it's, been a few <laughs> it's been a few months since I've even been over a boat. Good afternoon. I'm Captain John Turner. I'm commanding officer of Coast Guard Air Station in Clearwater, Florida. It's a pretty exciting time to have father and son flying together. It's a uh, bring your family to work day uh, to the extreme, but we'll put his father in the water. He'll get to be the duck or the survivor. And I know they're both very excited about today, and um, I'm just, I'm thrilled we can make it happen for them. CP ground, Coast Guard Rescue 6023. Crew ready for takeoff? Ready for takeoff. We're uh, ready to go back here, sir. Who's first or what's first? I'll be going first. This is Spencer. All right, what do you want? I'll, uh, I'll take a free fall, sir. OK. So we got on scene and got right into the swimmer work. Duck's going down. Duck is halfway down. Duck is in the water. While I'm at the door, I'm looking at him and just making sure nothing's swimming up on him. It's, it's been shark week, so we've been thinking about that a lot. If he gets hurt, mom's going to kill me. And you can deploy swimmer. Roger, deploying swimmer. Swimmer's way. Swimmer's in the water. It was a lot of fun to be in the water with him today. Uh, it was just cool to, to get out there and, and play around. It was great. Just fun. A lot of just a blast. It lowered me down six different times. I uh, used the basket a couple times. A couple of direct extractions. One where he just bear hugged me. Roger, summer survivor coming up. I actually wanted to stay out there longer. It was uh, it was fun. It was a, a heck of an opportunity for both of us. He said it was a top ten day for him, and I say it was for me too. And uh, we just had a blast out there. It was a lot of fun. Words can't begin to describe uh, fully how proud I am of Spencer. It was uh, a lot of fun and, again, a, uh, an honor and privilege.